Good morning, everybody. My name is Jack Danderman, and I want to, on behalf of all of my colleagues here at ISRI, welcome you to, well, welcome to you, you to the Fed 2021 conference. Also, welcome you to Redlands virtually. It's nice and warm here, unlike our normal experience of the Fed GIS conference, cold and freezing inside of the convention center in downtown DC. But anyway, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. This is an important few days. It'll be important for us to share and tell you what we're doing. The purpose is always to connect people, to have them share and learn and create a better understanding within our little community. And you are a very interesting audience for me, special, I would say. You're a community of GIS professionals working across the different agencies in the federal government. You have mission work, you have different disciplines, you have different uh, backgrounds in different geographies. And the mission of this year's conference is about interconnecting our national government using GIS and geography. I'll come back to that theme again and again. But I'd like to always start this meeting with a little bit of sharing of your work. This is important work. I mean, it's some of the most important work underway in our country and in the world. You're working on basically all the big issues in natural resources, from climate change to looking at social conflicts and urbanization and development, water resources, all of this. And over the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at examples that you shared with me about your work. Every one of them is an amazing little story. It's an icon of, of what it means to be a GIS professional working in public service. Some of you are working on some of the big issues of environmental monitoring and modeling and assessment. These examples make it clear that we are measuring environmental change, looking at everything from countrywide air pollution to local pollution. This map done by Harvard University on environmental justice and racial equality shows the impact, the disproportionate impact of air pollution on blacks in the South. Last year, we had massive wildfires here in the West. And the map that's brilliant red there on the right is showing the impact of ozone moving across the United States. Actually, more ozone was emitted in those couple of months of wildfires, burning 4 million acres of forest here in our country, uh, than all of the air pollution contaminated for, uh, contaminants emitted by all the vehicles for many years across the United States. Look at the interesting work going on on delivering measurements like air quality and weather to citizens on devices. And then there's this beautiful map that's in the lower right showing airflow modeling at a micro level. Lots of work going on here. In the world of natural resources, we're seeing uh, climate's impact creating change dramatically, like forest change or land cover change or the effect of drought. The map in the upper left is showing the effect of, of climate change on specific lakes in Iraq. And I'll just finish by pointing out this one that shows coral and habitat modeling. The changes in the oceans are really dramatic. Your work in natural resource management is outstanding. You're looking at agricultural change and managing it more effectively, looking at agricultural suitability assessments across, for example, all of Mexico. And in the upper right, looking at forecasting winter wheat across Asia, very important for our own economic health here in the United States. In the field of transportation, GIS has long distinguished the ability to manage and do analytics on transportation systems. And these maps are pretty amazing. The ones in the lower left show RF and ship tracking from traditional means from AIS. And look at the interesting work going on in Maryland, showing in real time all operations on all highways. And then there's using AI and machine learning to do and assess various environmental characteristics that are impacting accidents in Indonesia. <laughs> and one of my favorites here is the drone delivery uh, routing. This is using like air corridors to optimize routing for product delivery across the countryside. 
These are new maps for me. They're looking at financial as well as public infrastructure oversight. You're looking at where the money goes and what its effect is, and being able to target where the money should go, things like business loan and grant targeting and economic development. And well, there's this major issue of the digital divide that people talk about, and this has to do with broadband coverage for real. Your work in those areas is amazing because it's, it's illuminating where we have gaps. And then there's the more traditional energy and telecom coverage, wind generation infrastructure across the nation, which does require oversight and understanding for us to make our country better. GIS has been moving recently into the field of buildings and facilities, modeling complete buildings with BIM models and then bringing them into GIS. But these examples go much further than that. They're looking at space planning, space management, and look at the beautiful, interesting maps on the lower right showing work order management within uh, government housing in New York City. I think we're going to see a revolution in the ability to utilize buildings more effectively using GIS as a framework and as a background. Our world, our nation, our country, our cities, our regions are becoming safer because GIS is impacting from a holistic perspective, giving us insight into problem areas. These maps show things like crime density and patterns, doing hotspot analysis. Some of them are showing in the lower left, for example, uh, conflict assessments for the entire continent of Africa. And then there's looking at managing statewide emergency management issues. GIS has long distinguished itself, or you have distinguished GIS, I would say, in the area of disaster preparation and response. These examples show everything from debris recovery to fire change to hurricane impacts to hurricane awareness and uh, flooding. All, all of these things uh, organizations like FEMA and individual agencies are working on systematically using geography as a foundation. In the last few decades, remote sensing, imagery, LIDAR in more recent times have become a major part of GIS. And these examples show your work in everything from simple vegetation mapping to looking at building change analysis in geographies and cities. We're seeing from satellites, the ability to track vessel movements and discrepancy between AIS feeds and RF feeds. These are interesting issues that the remote sensing gives us that we've not been able to see in the past. Mapping and cartography are, are just the language of GIS, we might say. And these examples show us some real interesting work. You're making, for example, beautiful forest maps so that people, visitors, can have access to and visualize forests in new ways. Other examples show us the, the mysteries of coral reefs around the world, the good work from Conservation International. And uh, USGS, through their 3 dep program, is not only allowing us to see and analyze more effectively terrain, but also providing beautiful backdrops, for example, this soil and ecological mapping thematic map. Portals, one of my favorite subjects, enabling open data and citizen engagement allows us to make our data available. And these are a few of the examples. Crowdsourcing information, getting data in, for example, the mapping of trees or doing citizen science, but also the ability to provide open data to organizations, community portals, the education statistics, uh, the data hub, for example, for COVID uh, done by HHS. These are amazing contributions. And then what I'm seeing systematically is more of you are building interactive applications so that people in a browser can do, example, for example, watershed analysis, or they can do uh, their own discovery of the best location to do uh, register their, their votes. 
Uh, and again, I'll draw your attention to one of my favorites, which is the spatial bibliography that was done by NOAA. It's really opened up all the publications around Alaska and allowed people to browse and look and examine this information. Demographics, social equity, and public health are major, major issues that people care a lot about, especially in the last couple of years. The Census Bureau, as we'll hear about in a few minutes, used GIS as a foundation for carrying out the 2020 census. And this map in the upper left shows the census response rate predictions that were made in order for them to know where to knock on doors as opposed to do mail outs. Um, in the upper right, we also see their work showing the insured and uninsured rates by state. Well, lots of information has been analyzed here and visualized, but one of my favorite is done by the city of San Antonio, a kind of interactive equity atlas, which allows different government programs to be evaluated systematically against uh, their, their racial equity uh, implications. Let me also say a big shout out to all of you who worked on the COVID-19 response. We're still in the midst of this pandemic. And these examples show the sort of breadth and reach of what's happened. Literally thousands of organizations have used GIS to help them not only tell the stories of where the cases are moving, but also be able to do analysis. For example, the one in North Carolina where they're forecasting where infection rates will be going, but then overlaying it against hospital capacity, a fundamental spatial analysis activity. And today, with vaccine, we're seeing picking the right location for vaccine sites. What are the drive times? How do we do location allocation modeling? The great work being done by the National Guard in South Carolina shows this. It's uh, amazing. And then, by the way, some of you used the patterns of COVID's movement to evaluate against different operations, like the Army Corps against their, their operations around the country and also looking at the impact of COVID against fire fighters. And also fundamental here has been the work done by the Census Bureau in planning out their activities in the, in the context of COVID. Speaking about the Census Bureau, this year, I'm privileged to be able to make the Making a Difference Award uh, acknowledgement to the US Census Bureau. This is an organization who is perhaps less known by many people, but also more known by many people. And every year, every decade, they count all of us. And <laughs> This last year, they did an amazing job. Here, I'd like to introduce, to receive this award, Ron Jarman and Deirdre Bishop to receive the Making a Difference Award. Ron, Deirdre, would you like to say something? Jack, we, re we really want to thank you for recognizing the hard work of the folks at the Census Bureau um, at, in pulling off a successful 2020 census. So, you know, GIS tools and, and ESRI tools in particular were critical for our preparations for the 2020 census, but maybe even more so in making adjustments during the census because, you know, we were doing the census during um, the COVID pandemic, during hurricane season, we had wildfires out west. So it was a very challenging time, and the use of GIS was really critical um, for having us be able to make those real game time adjustments in the census that allowed us to be successful. Um, but you know, it doesn't stop there. Um, you know, we're, we're using uh, all GIS tools as a sort of central uh, organizing premise around modernizing our programs for for to improve data products for our users and to get ready for the 2030 census. So. One of the great initiatives that we're doing that Deirdre is actually leading, uh, we call frames. And it, it sort of centralizes all of our survey frame information and, and geography is the central organizing tenant of the whole thing. So we're really honored that, that you recognized our hard work this way and we look to continue um, that success into the future. So Deirdre, did you wanna add anything? I'd love to, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jack, for selecting the Census Bureau as the recipient of this year's Making a Difference Award. I'm honored to be here with you to accept this award on behalf of everyone at the Census Bureau that worked hard to design, plan, research, test, and implement the 2020 Census. Over the past few years, you invited us to tell our story 
on your conference stage. And we shared information about how this census incorporated the use of geographic information systems throughout its design. Using the Census Bureau's Map Tiger system, our national database, and then tools provided by ESRI, along with special applications. We use those tools to help establish where to count all the people, to motivate them to self-respond, to knock on their doors when they didn't, and now to tabulate all the people to the correct geographic location. We look forward to sharing the 2020 census results, and we're anxious to watch how this GIS community uses our information to help make informed decisions for our future. Thanks again. Well, Ron and Deidre, you are two of my heroes, actually, in the federal government. And this Baking a Difference Award, I really wish I could personally give it to you. It's, uh, it has special meaning, uh, making a difference. And many of the users here listening make a difference. Their footprints are all over the federal government. But the work done by the Census Bureau, building this foundation information, not only uh, addresses the mission of getting the census done, in effective ways, a geographic way. But also the information, you know, is a foundation for the other federal agencies. It makes a difference. It's also a foundation for state and local government. And it's also a foundation for business commerce and university research. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just wish you were all together so that we could together acknowledge the great work of these two special people, but also this particularly special agency.